Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. This is God's word. Uh, Who would be interested if I could show you a way to have more money at the end of next week than you thought you'd have? A a guaranteed way. Uh, Who would be interested if I could uh, reduce your household chores next week? Guaranteed. Anyone interested? Would anyone be interested in more free time next week? And Guaranteed. Would anyone be interested in better health? next week. Guaranteed. Um, Now, you don't have to sign up. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to learn any special techniques. You don't really need any instruction, but maybe, uh, let me count the words. Well, just one word, and all these things I'm promising, guaranteed. Uh, It's more than one word. Fast for one day next week. You'll save save one-seventh of your food costs. You won't be buying food and cooking and cleaning. You'll have that time that you're eating free. Um, and then uh, it's interesting, the, the, the benefits of fasting, the, the, the scientists and medicine, I, there's a report in October that it can, it can stop Alzheimer's, or Alzheimer if you fast. Uh, there's something called uh, autophagy that was discovered by a Japanese scientist in 2016 or at least he explained it, where it sort of recycles your cells when your body fasts. Um, That's not even to mention, say, dieting or something. All those benefits are available with fasting. And yet, um, fasting has been practiced throughout Christendom, but I would hazard to say that at our present time, we're probably the best-fed Christians in the history of the world here in Canada. I can't walk past the fridge without opening it up. that we don't really fast. And, uh, you know, it's uh, something that's going to help us with our walk with God. And we happen to see fasting as an affliction. So I want to talk about fasting. It's in our passage, but let's pray first. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the prayers of the saints on my behalf. And I would just ask that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may walk in a manner fully pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about fasting. It's in our passage, but I just kind of wanted to address it up front. So uh, fasting, what are the biblical requirements for fasting? I sort of expected there'd be a whole bunch of laws, but there's only one command from God, and that is for fasting on the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, and that's when the high priest would make a sacrifice to pay for the penalty of the sins of the people and reconcile the people with God. That was the only time for fasting. It's in Leviticus 23. And in the bulletin, I have the references for all the... I'm not going to necessarily call out all the references each time. But it says, Now on the tenth day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. You shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. So even then, fasting was healthy. 
you didn't fast, you'd be executed. So um, fasting, that's the only law that we have. But what we also have is we have examples. And I'll just give a few. There's many, and maybe I won't give out your favorite example of fasting. But the first one is David and Bathsheba. If you remember that uh, David had a, an affair with Bathsheba, they had a child, the child was sick. And so David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So another example, Queen Esther, she found out that there was a plot to persecute the Jews. And so then this is what Esther told to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And then Jonah. So uh, this, is, this is a non-Christian fasting. This is the king of Nineveh. Uh, he heard the news that Jonah was proclaiming that they needed to repent of their sins. And he said, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast... Even the animals are included here. Herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So these examples show us that fasting is linked to repentance, confession, and petitions, of great ur petitions to God of great urgency. So what about the New Testament? Is there, is there a lot of commands in the New Testament to fast? Well, there's no commands in the New Testament to fast. Not that I could find. But what there is in the New Testament, there are, are several examples, and there is the expectation that we will be fasting. And so... Uh, one example is when Jesus was presented as a young child at the temple. We're told about Anna, who was a prophetess. She was 84 years old. And it says that she, was, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. We also have the temptation of Jesus, perhaps the most famous example of fasting, where he fasted for 40 days before he entered the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In the book of Acts, we have... Uh, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the early church was using fasting to understand God's will. And of course, Jesus mentions uh, fasting on the Sermon on the Mount. And when do you fast? This is what I mean by expectation. And when you fast. He presumes people will be fasting and he's giving them instructions. Do not look gloomy like hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces with their fasting. Uh, their faces, sorry. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Now, all of you look like you washed your faces this morning, so I don't know. Maybe you've all fasted. But you're not supposed to, um, you know, make a big show of it. What about church history? Is, is, fasting in, is there fasting in church history? Well, it's prominent throughout church history. Um, from the beginning of the early church, we have the Desert Fathers, we have monasteries all fasting. At different times, it became very legalistic. In the 6th century, it, it became mandatory for Christians, and that's not a good thing. It's not, the Bible doesn't tell us we have to fast. The church shouldn't tell, make up laws. That's legalism. Names Mar Martin Luther, John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley praised its value and encouraged its proper use. And Wesley found fasting so important that he would not ordain anyone who wasn't fasting two days a week. It's a pretty good standard. Um, the Puritans called it soul fattening, which is a nice name. And then Hudson Taylor, uh, writing about the Chinese, he said, In Shanxi, I found Chinese Christians who were accustomed to spend time in fasting and prayer. 
they recognize that this fasting, which so many dislike, which requires faith in God, since it makes one feel weak and poorly, is really a divinely appointed means of grace. Perhaps the greatest hindrance to our work is our own imagined strength. And in fasting, we learn what poor, weak creatures we are, dependent on a meal of meat for a little strength, which we are so apt to lean upon. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and C.S. Lewis were also very much in favor and practicing fasting. So just as you think about fasting, in the bulletin I have a resource which is from the C.S. Lewis Institute, which is a really nice summary. You'll see a few of the points I grabbed from that. Um, but if you're more interested in that, and I hope you are, uh, you can follow that. But don't make a public display. It's not a time to be prideful or to be self-righteous or legalistic about it. And um, also, it, there's, no, there's no guarantee that your prayer is going to be answered. I mentioned David. His prayer wasn't answered. The child died. It's not a, it's not a question of, I'm going to put my prayer on steroids, or I'm going to turbo prayer by adding fasting to it. Don't, it's not, that's not the way to think of it. Andrew Murray said, fasting helps express, deepens, confirms the resolution that we are ready to sacrifice anything, even ourselves, to attain what we seek for the kingdom of God. So, that's fasting. So now we're going to get to our passage, sort of. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the context and Daniel did a great job last week on last week's passage. We're following on, so uh, we're going to draw on some of the things he had. And uh, just as far as the context, uh, they're, at, they're at Levi or Matthew's house, same person. That's where they are. But as far as the book of Luke, in, it's this sort of calling of the disciples starts in uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 1, and runs to Luke chapter 6, verse 16. And so I like the fact we do a few verses at a time, but sometimes you sort of forget where we're at. But Jesus is calling his disciples. That's where we're at in this passage. And there's other things going on, like the healing of the leper and a paralytic, but it's calling the disciples. And the, and the non-disciples, as we're finding out, they, they're not really happy with who he's choosing to be disciples. And so the sort of sub, subtext to this is... Um, complaints about the people Jesus is choosing. And we have four groups in this house. So we're in the living room. We're in Levi's living room, and we have four groups of people. And the first group of people we have are the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself. And so Matthew's there, and I don't know what other, you know, it doesn't say who's not there, but there's, it says his disciples are there. So that's the first group. The second group are the uh, disciples of John the Baptist, and John was a cousin of Jesus, and he was the herald or forerunner pointing to Jesus as the Lamb of God. And he was calling out people for their need of repentance, and those that did were baptized. So this is his group of disciples. And then the third group that we have in the house are the Pharisees. And the Hebrew word for Pharisees means separated, and they really emphasize personal piety, and they were very much in favor of following all 600 plus commands in the Bible, including rituals concerning ceremonial purification. So that's group number three. So we have first group is Jesus' disciples, then we have John the Baptist's disciples, and, and the Pharisees, by the way, they were disciples too. I think you could call them disciples. And uh, if you'll remember in Acts, when Paul is giving his own description as a Pharisee, he said that he sat, on, sat at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a famous Pharisee at the time. So they were Pharisees. The Pharisees were disciples. So we have three groups of disciples. And uh, I just thought I, this may be not be perfect. You could think of the Pharisees as having both feet in the Old Testament, the disciples of John kind of having a bit of a straddle into the New, and the disciples of Jesus being in the New Testament. That's not perfect, but it's kind of helpful. And then we have a fourth group. Were they disciples? Uh, it's called tax collectors and sinners, and as Daniel pointed out last week, the, the tax collectors were really not just tax collectors, but they were thieves and traitors. They were working for the Roman government that was oppressing, oppressing the Jewish people. So that's a fourth group, and my question to you is, are they disciples? Okay, we'll see. I'm gonna come back to that, but are those people disciples? 
So, it says, I, I finally got to the passage. You'll, you'll be relieved I got to it. So, we're in verse 33. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. So I'd like to cover off first, they're fasting often. I just told you that there was only one commanded fast in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement. The disciples of John, they're fasting often. And I think this makes sense. Uh, certainly the repentance was a theme for John. Um, fasting was linked to, to re repentance. And also you remember John was an ascetic. Um, he was, you know, just eating locusts and honey. This, the fact that his disciples would be fasting off and kind of fits in with who he was. The Pharisees, they were adding additional laws for the people to fast. They added fast days. And they were also known to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. So they were fasting all the time. And in contrast, Jesus' disciples were not fasting. You can kind of imagine in this living room scene... It's, it's an awkward scene, I think, because you have these sinners, tax collectors, you have these Pharisees who want to stay separate from the world, and they're in this living room where I don't think they'd ever think they would find themselves, and they're looking, and, and they might say to one of, of uh, Jesus' disciples, don't you guys fast? It's like Thursday or, or you know, whatever day of the week it is. And they look at Jesus and like, like should we be fasting? But I think it's interesting that they came in. Jesus is such an attractive figure to them. He's so interesting to them that they're moving in here, but they're still having trouble with what's going on. They can't understand this difference. So then Jesus answers them. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? I think we all know the answer to the question. No, you can't do that. We were at a lovely wedding yesterday. And I don't think it would have been appropriate for me to say, someone say, John, why aren't you eating? And it's like, well, I know it's a celebration, but I just want to concentrate on my sin and repent, and I'm not eating today. I don't think that's what God wants from us. So it's a simple answer. No, you don't fast when the bridegroom is there. And let's not miss something else here. C.S. Lewis says, Jesus suddenly remarks one day, no one need asked while I am here. Who is this man who remarks that his mere presence suspends all normal rules? Think of that. Somebody walks into the room and we decide we can or cannot eat based on his presence. It's a pretty big claim. Now did these disciples understand this? So let's look at first at, at the Pharisees. And I'm going to read a passage from Isaiah uh, 54. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. So that's the husband, the bridegroom. And this is really a claim to deity that he is the son of God that Jesus is making here. What about John's disciples? Would they have got this reference? Well, we read in John 3, 29, and I, I don't know if this came chronologically before, but it certainly represents what John the Baptist was thinking. Uh, it was consistent with him. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So John recognizes he's the bridegroom, and he recognizes this is a time for celebration, not for fasting. And I don't, I don't know that John the Baptist was there. Um, so in summary, fasting is intended to bring us closer to God. Here the disciples were with God and Jesus, and fasting serves no purpose. And also, being with the bridegroom is a time for celebration rather than for mourning and repentance. Verse 35, the, day, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So Jesus is prophesying that there's a big change coming, 
and specifically, he's predicting his own death. And while his death was voluntary and fully under the sovereign will of God, the temple guard did come to Gethsemane and take Jesus away from his disciples. So here again, we have a, not a command, but an expectation that fasting will occur. He says, then they will fast. And I've already given you the examples that they did fast. They did fast in Acts, and they did fast in the, in the early church, and they've been fasting all throughout Christendom. Verse 36, he also told them a parable. No one, put, no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. So I think, I think this is simple. Um, I'm not a seamstress. Uh, Kyoko would know better than the rest of us. But if you have something as old that's been washed many times, it's done all the shrinking it's going to do, and then if you, get a, if you get a tear in it and you want to patch it and you grab something that has not been washed ever before, um, the other versions of the story in the other Gospels say unshrunk rather than new. You sew them together. Then when you wash it, it's not going to look good because it's going to pucker. And when you wear it, it might rip. So it doesn't work. So that's, that's simple. Let's go to the next one. Sorry, I just wanted to mention... It's not going to match the old one. And then in Matthew it says, for the patch tears away from the garment and makes a worse tear. So it's not a good thing to do. Then we have the wineskins. Again, I think it's a pretty simple illustration. So in those days, they didn't have uh, bottles. and The fermentation process took place inside the wineskin, which would be made for sheep from sheep or goat. And they would sew up the wineskin. They'd pour the fresh wine into it. And then wine ferments, and when it ferments, there's gases, and it expands, and the skins expand, and everything's good. And then you have good wine. But then when you finish that wine and you say, well, it's a lot of work. I would think it's a lot of work to make a wine skin. Um, so you think, well, I'll just use the old wine skin, and I'll pour some new wine into it. So the wine skin expands, but the leather has already expanded. So now it's going to burst, and you're going to uh, destroy the old wine skin, which which may be of some use as like a canteen or something for water, but um, all the new wine is just going to pour on the ground when it bursts. Okay? So I think those are simple. Nothing too hard about that. So in each of these two parables, Jesus is contrasting the old and the new. And this dinner party at the house of Levi is smack dab in the middle of this great sea change throughout all of history. They're right in the middle. And all of our calendars proclaim this big sea change. We have what they now call the BCE, which I like to call before the Christian era. And then we have the CE, which I call the Christian era. They call it common era. But every calendar is aware that this point, these three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, is a big change between old and new. And as Christians, we think of the old as the old covenant, the law, Judaism, and then the new is the new covenant, gospel, grace, and the church, this big divide. And as Christians, we rejoice that the new era has arrived and that the new covenant of grace is much better. Hebrews chapter 8 is a good chapter. I'll just read a few verses from that. Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. In speaking of the new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Then Jesus gives us verse 39, which says, And no one, after drinking old wine, desires the new, for he says, The old is good. Let, let that marinate for a while. The old is good. No one wants the new wine. Jesus is saying the opposite of what I would have expected. And of the three accounts in the uh, Gospels, this is the only one that has this verse. The old is good. No one wants the new. What struck me in meditating on these, these parables was the continuity between the old and the new and the concern for the old. And by continuity, I mean the old and new cloth, the old and new wine, wineskins, they're really 
the same thing except for wear and tear and age. There's not a big difference between the two. And by concern for the old, I mean there's this concern to take care that the old cloth doesn't rip any more than it's already ripped. Take care that the old wineskins don't burst. And then, of course, this statement that the old wine is better than the new. So they don't seem that different. It doesn't seem like that big a change, and there's concern for the, 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 uh, the old. A place where we run into this kind of split dichotomy between the old and the new is when we're debating people who don't believe in God. So, when you're debating an atheist about God, it's pretty quick that you're faced with their version of the Old Testament God, a God who is angry, vindictive, and legalistic. And some Christians retreat to the position that Jesus is different, his teachings are different in the New Testament, it's all different, and I worship Jesus, not that Old Testament God. And this is a very bad position to hold, and I call it the under new management position. So I think we all know of a restaurant where there's poor food and poor service, and no one wants to go there anyway, anymore. So then they put up a new sign, under new management. And what they want you to do is just forget about everything that's happened before, and now we have new management. A big change. At least they want you to think it's a big change. But, but uh, that's not what we believe. So what do we believe about old and new? Well, who created the old systems of laws? Who created all that? Our triune God. We're at Trinity Grace Church. Our triune God. Remember that the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal. The majesty co-eternal. Jesus has existed forever, just like God has existed forever. Now, not everything that happens in the Old Testament is good, but everything in the Old Testament that God does is just and righteous. The laws, the prophecies, the stories in the Old Testament are preparing us for the coming of Jesus. Now, interestingly, this building, 826 Ellington Avenue East, has an Old and New Testament. Now, you might say, oh, well, there's Leaside Bible Chapel and there's Trinity Grace Church, and Leaside Bible Chapel does have BC, LBC, so you might think it's, you know, Old Testament, but that is not the two Testaments I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is in 1958, is that right, Russell? Close to there? You want to provide a correction? Okay, 1958, there was families that decided that this, this community needed a church. And so they took mortgages out on their homes and they built everything from where Russ is sitting in the back and the back doors, they built everything out there. They built the storefronts, they built the, the upper room and the office and the washrooms and the Sunday school rooms, but none of this, this wasn't built. That's the Old Testament. And then as, they, as the numbers increased and the revenues increased, they built the New Testament, okay, old and new. And what's interesting about that is that the architect, I don't know that it was a very good architect, but the architect who, who drew it up, he drew up the whole thing. That's a crazy lobby to have for a little room upstairs and two stores. <laughs> like it wasn't like, it wasn't like that, that, he, that they just thought, hey, maybe we should add something on. They always knew what the plan was. And with God's help, they achieved that. And so that's the Old and New Testament. So they used to go all the way up those stairs to that little room. <laughs> but we don't have to go all the way up those stairs anymore. We can come into this big room, but, but we're not about to tear down that other part of the building, we're not going to get rid of that. It's still of use. And so, um, yeah, I, I just, most buildings are built in a way where people, it's an afterthought, and you can tell. But this was always intended, and you can't tell that. So it's the same way between the Old and the New Testament. 
The arrival of Jesus was carefully planned all the way back, well, from the beginning of time, but certainly it's mentioned in Genesis 3.15. And so it's always there. It's always the plan. So the old cloth is good, just like that part of the building. It's good. And it was woven by Jesus. And the old wine is good. It was fermented by Jesus. And they're still incredibly valuable today. And that is, examples of that is after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus was uh, talking to the disciples, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The Old Testament is all about Jesus. There's almost 300 direct quotations of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then there's hundreds of allusions that are obviously based on the Old Testament. The two are intertwined in many ways. So we can't, we can't patch up the old. I want to talk about that. So how do we understand the law? Um, and I just found this, I, I didn't make this up. This has been around a long time. But it's useful to divide the law into civil, moral, and ceremonial. We don't just throw it out. It's still useful, but just listen to this. So civil. Civil has all sorts of strange laws and things about how people should conduct themselves. And the one I'm going to pick on is everyone should have a parapet built on the roof of their house. Now, it's not easy. I mean, it should be easy to tell Christians, right? They're the ones with parapets around the roof of their houses. But, but we don't have that, like a low wall. And the purpose of the low wall was to, so that your neighbors, when they're up there, they wouldn't fall off by accident. So that law is a principle it gives us a principle that we should be concerned about our neighbor's welfare in our own homes. So in our own home, I built a handrail going down to our basement because we have our washroom down there and so guests won't fall. That's the same principle as this parapet. And actually on this building up here, uh, right up there, there's a hatch. You go up the hatch, there's a little fence that the building code says we should have. And the building codes and many of our laws are built on the principles that have been laid out in Scripture in the Old Testament. Those are the civil laws. And then there's the moral laws, and those are things like thou shalt not murder, Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Those are still in effect, all those laws, even if the government's trying to chip away at those, they're still in effect. And then we have the ceremonial laws, and the ceremonial laws are all pointing towards Jesus. And the sacrifices in the temple were to cover sins. The animals died. They were to cover sins, much in the same way that animals had to die to provide the skins for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sorry, the Garden of Gethsemane. Garden of Eden. Getting ahead of myself. So these ceremonial laws point us to Jesus, but Jesus has fulfilled those laws. And remember, when Jesus died on the cross, when he said, it is finished, The curtain, a cloth, was ripped in two. And it was ripped in two from top to bottom. No one ripped it but God. God tore it up. And so Jesus provides a new and infinitely better way to cover our sins with his robe, with his righteousness. We don't want to fix that curtain. We don't want to sew it back together. But it's still valuable in pointing us to Jesus. And we couldn't just put new wine into old wineskins. So, again, going back to this verse 39, and no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. And I don't, many, may, maybe you're all teetotalers, but most people seem to know that old wine, well, certainly it has to ferment. I mean, that's part of being wine, but most people think, Older wine is better than newer wines to a point. So that's understood. And the laws of the Old Testament and the ceremonies, those were familiar and time-tested and people were comfortable with those and they liked them. But the new wine is hard to take. So Jesus teaching on divorce, when he gave his new wine, people were saying, well, who would ever get married if that's the teaching? And then the, the rich young ruler who came to him and Jesus said, sell all that you have. He walked away. The Sermon on the Mount. If, if, you, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. If you've um, been angry at someone, you've committed murder. This new wine, it's hard to take. 
the, uh, declaring his sonship, that he was the son of God. Very hard for people to take. And we're about to take communion. So let's, let's just read again. Many of you know this, but let's read again the new wine that Jesus gave us about communion. John 6, 52. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. That's the new wine. And there's, some, there's an amazing promise that we have eternal life, that Christ will abide in us. But you get to verse 66. After this, many of his disciples, Jesus' disciples, turned back and no longer walked with him. No one after drinking new wine desires, sorry, no one after drinking old wine desires the new. And eventually this new wine would be so distasteful that Jesus would be executed, and not for his miracles, but for his teachings and claims of divinity. So that's the passage, and I have two challenges. The first challenge, remember those four groups at the house. And one group, this fourth group, was tax collectors and others. It says tax collectors and others in Luke, and it says tax collectors and sinners in the other two passages. And I asked the question, are they disciples? Well, I think that everyone is a disciple, whether they know they are or not, whether they've made a conscious decision or not. So as an example, you could say, I am not a health fanatic. I'm not interested in exercise, diet, or vitamins. I'm not part of you guys. You're all following different people. You're runners, or you're eating vegetarian food, whatever. I'm not part of that. I j I'm, not, I'm not interested. Well, we're all part of the health world, <laughs> whether you're a disciple or not. And you are being discipled and actively influenced by Tim Hortons to eat more donuts and Miss Vicky's to eat more chips and Netflix to binge watch and lie on the couch all day. And those are going to impact your health much, as much or more than these health disciples that you're not following. You, you can't evade it. And in the same way, people can say, I'm not religious. This doesn't apply to me. I'm no one's disciple. I just do my own thing. Well, the powers, there are powers out there that are seeking you as a disciple. And you know what? They have no problem with you being an unaware and unthinking disciple. In fact, that's probably all for the best. And so, as you watch television, movies, YouTube, news reports, sports programming, or anything else that I've left out there, you are being actively discipled by René Descartes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Jacques Derrida, all those guys are discipling you and you do, maybe you don't even know it. As you're learning about, or you're being, it's being promoted to you, hedonism, materialism, atheism, cultural Marxism, and queer theory. Those are all being pushed out to you and you are being actively discipled. Even if you're a disciple of Christ, they want you as their disciple and that's happening all day long. And, and I've made this point before, you're listening to one sermon this morning, and every TV show you turn on is another sermon that's discipling you, every single one. And Hockey Night in Canada is discipling you, and I can back that up, anyone who wants to talk about hockey. Okay, it's not about hockey. So here's the challenge. I said there was a challenge. I'm imploring you to intentionally become a disciple today if you're not a disciple. Today's a good day. If smoking's bad and you want to quit, today's a good day to quit smoking. And if being a disciple's good, today's a good day to become a disciple. And the first, what's the first most important step in becoming a disciple? The first most important step is to decide who you're going to be discipled by. Nothing's more important than that. So I have a few tips, a few tips to share with you about how you can become, or how you should choose who to be a disciple of. So you should choose someone who is wise and understand how the world works. Those men I mentioned in that long list, you may not be familiar, but they don't really understand how the world works. They, they think they do, 
they give you bad advice. You want to choose someone who knows the future, not just the past. Um, you know, there's, there's this example where if you're a chicken, the farmer seems like a nice guy. He's been feeding you all year. Like, he comes every day. Who could ask for a nicer guy? That's the past. But what's the future? Does somebody know the future? You want someone who can tell you about the future. You want someone with integrity, someone you can trust. A lot of these people uh, that I mentioned were very flawed individuals. You also want someone who loves you and has your best interests at heart, who wants you to grow and thrive. These, these people, they, they're bitter people. They, a lot of them came to a bad end. You don't, they don't care about you. And, and it's very important that you choose someone who's living. So choose Jesus. And, and also remember that when Jesus chose his disciples, he chose the untrained, the sinners, and everyone was welcome to become Jesus' disciple. And we have it recorded that even some of John's disciples became Jesus' disciples. And Pharisees like Nicodemus and Paul, they became disciples too. Everyone was welcome, and uh, they didn't have to be righteous. They didn't have to be educated. So that's the first challenge. Become a disciple of Jesus. The second challenge is for those of you who already are disciples of Jesus. And I'm going to begin by reading Matthew 9, 25. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Or what I'd like to say is disciples without a leader. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So currently at TGC, we have ESL. We're, we're reaching out to people who don't speak English, uh, visitors to our country. We've just started TG Youth. We have missionaries here who are doing work in Thorncliffe and Fl Flemington, and we're supporting missionaries in other parts of the world. Um, but what about our friends and family, the rest of us, who aren't part of that? How are we reaching out to them? Most of them don't think they're disciples, and certainly they're without a shepherd. So we're planning a series of prayer meetings to ask God for guidance about sending out workers. And in these meetings, we'll share relevant scripture, spend time in prayer, and also discuss different options for outreach. And also, I think it would be a good day to fast on those days. And, and I, think, I think we have things to repent for. Um, it's not just about uh, the need to uh, send out workers, but, you know, have we, do we really love our neighbors? Do we really believe everything that's said in the Bible? I think we have a lot to confess for. And so, if you're interested in joining us, I know there's a lot of different activities, but just let Joseph Chan or myself know, and we'll start working out some times. And we're just going to pray and fast and think about what we can do in addition to the works that are already happening. Um, so that is challenge number two. So in conclusion, I'd like to read from John 4, verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. They're speaking to Jesus. Rabbi, eat, because he wasn't eating. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, may we be fed by your word and as faithful disciples accomplish your will and gather in the harvest. Amen. Thank you.